if you're a business owner, there's gonna come a point where you need a stronger tech stack to have a clear picture of everything all in one place. From startup to enterprise, NetSuite is your one-stop solution. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast too. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers. 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have been upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. 25, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you can get a customized solution for all of your KPIs and one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There's a better way to create a website, a professional, crisp website you'll be proud to publish, and it just takes seconds. This is all thanks to Hostinger's AI website generator. I recently took this for a test drive, even shared this on my YouTube channel. It was mind-blowing. Not just how quick you can build a website, but with the AI, how great it actually can write copy for you. You can use the AI logo maker, plus it got it up in no time, and it looks good. Absolutely mind-blowing. So if you want to build a website, go to Hostinger, because they're a top, highly-rated global web hosting platform. And all you have to do to build a website is just answer three questions and let the AI do all the work for you. You can build as many web pages as you need without knowing how to code a single line of anything. They have great support, too. That was one thing that I had a problem with with a with a with another host back in the day. Hostinger has 24-7 support and a library of video guides. And here's the thing. You can do this for less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. That is crazy. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast, you can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name, H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R.com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. Give it a spin. This is a Smart Passive Income Podcast with Pat Flynn, session number 102. Boom. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now, so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, he won most improved player in basketball when he was six, Pat Flynn. Want to stop grinding through resumes and just meet your match already? Well, you can with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. It's your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, plus their matching engine helps you find quality candidates fast. And it works like really fast. In fact, by the time this ad's over, 23 new hires will have been made on Indeed, according to Indeed data worldwide. It's the perfect match of speed and quality. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites. And I think Indeed is the place to go. It's easy to manage. Everything is in just one spot. The interview process, it's scalable with you and your business as it grows. Like there's no other platform you would need than Indeed. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored ad job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. You need a hire, you need Indeed. We entrepreneurs are at our desks a lot. So having solid equipment is super important. And a sit stand desk can make a huge difference as many folks on our team will attest to. If you haven't tried one yet, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Over a million customers have chosen Uplift Desk. Innovative product designs, reasonable pricing, same-day shipping, free accessories with every desk. You can see why they're such a big hit. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? And that covers the complete desk, by the way, not just the top or some fine print like that. Moving while you work is just healthier. And Uplift Desk provides a state-of-the-art experience. They're stable, made of very solid materials. There's over 100 desktop choices and customizations available. Just the choices for material for your desk are amazing, all the way from laminate to eco to bamboo to solid wood. If you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. 
Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? This is Pat Flynn, and welcome to session 102, or 102, or however you want to say it, of the Smart Passive Income Podcast. I'm really, really happy you're here, and I kind of just want to dive right into today's episode because I have an amazing guest with us, Adam Braun from PencilsOfPromise.org, an amazing organization that's building schools around the world for people who don't have schools. Um, it's just an amazing story, and he just came out with this new book called The Promise of a Pencil. Gosh, it's this is changing my view on what I want to do. I'm, I have to think bigger. And yes, I do donate some of my income to charities and, 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 and things like that. But I, I want to go bigger. And Adam is helping me think that way. We talk about in this episode all about nonprofit versus for profit and doing things beyond just what we're doing here in business and for ourselves, but doing things for other people who don't have the ability or the money or school or education and things like that. I mean, it's just incredible and so i'm just gonna go ahead and say let's just go right into the interview right now here's adam braun from pencilsofpromise.org all right i'm so happy to welcome adam braun to the smart passive income podcast adam how are you today i'm doing great uh thank you so much for having me thank you for coming on um congratulations on on the book that you have coming out the promise of a pencil and i i, I want to get into the book but before that you know let's just talk about what what it is that you do i mean obviously you're an author but but you know, if, if someone came up to you and said, Adam, what is it that you do? What would you say? I would say that first and foremost, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, I've been starting small, medium, and large businesses for as long as I can remember, whether it was a kid, uh, you know, trading baseball cards and basketball cards to selling uh, burnt CDs on eBay when I was 13 to <laughs> working uh, in the financial sector all the way um, up. Up until when I was uh, about uh, 25 years old, when I started the organization that I now run uh, called Pencils of Promise. And uh, we build schools, um, train teachers, and provide scholarships to students uh, all across uh, the developing world. So, you know, really the base of the pyramid, people living often on less than $2 a day. And, uh, you know, what we're most known for is, is building schools in some of the most challenging and difficult rural environments in the world. What made you want to? You know, entrepreneur, yes, I get it, you know, building businesses, but what, what made you want to, you know, do something like this where you're actually building schools in these developing countries? Sure. So, you know, my, my, my story has taken a couple pretty drastic turns, um, like probably most entrepreneurs. But, uh, you know, growing up, I, I wanted to work in finance. And so I had all these early experiences with hedge funds and fund of funds and uh, institutional banks. And off of that, I really got a, a pretty strong sense of how great businesses are built. Um, and I saw the way that for-profit business acumen could help scale an idea from its infancy and in, in through that kind of maturity stage all the way uh, up and until l large, really massive scale. And uh, when I was 21, I went into the developing world for the first time, and I had a habit of asking one child per country, what do you want most in the world? And I'd have him write it down on a piece of paper. And um, I found this boy who was begging on the streets of, of India and just, you know, no family, no nothing. Um, and asked, asked him the question. He was my one kid in that country. And as much as I thought I would hear, you know, a, a house or, um, you know, a fast car or something, uh, his answer blew me away. I said, if you could have anything in the world, what would you want? And he said, a pencil. Um, and I, I didn't almost understand why. And as I started to probe a bit deeper, I learned that this boy had never been to school before in his life. And the thing that I had always taken for granted you know, being raised in a, a household that really prioritized education. And I knew that education was the one thing that lifted my family out of poverty over several generations dating back uh, just, you know, 50, 60 years ago when my grandparents were uh, in concentration camps and Holocaust survivors came to this country on a boat. And it was this access to education that helped them, you know, advance their situation, my parents advanced their situation, and then my siblings and I hopefully doing the same. And this kid didn't have access to that one basic building block. And so gave him a pencil, he lit up, started passing out pens and pencils as I would travel, which opened up all these great conversations with people. And I came back to New York, um, landed a great job uh, at Bain uh, as working consulting, top tier firm. And as much as I was learning, I couldn't get this kind of idea out of my head that if you could apply the best business practices of the best businesses in the world to our most important humanitarian issues, you could build something that could really change things. And uh, that's how I started a little bit more than five years ago, uh, really on the side of my job to kind of tap into my passion and, you know, not, not necessarily leave my job, but try and have something on the side that made me come alive. And that's when I started with uh, $25 in a bank account, hoping to build one school. Uh, and that was the formation of Pencils of Promise. 
That's great. That's a fantastic story. Um, how did you, how did you get started? So you had this idea. You had a, a, a wanting to go and do more, and and you you know you started on the side. What what did that start look like? Was it just like a, a website, or you know what what were your first moves? No, so you know I think a lot of people make the mistake of assuming that they have to go huge from the very beginning, and that means that they incur a lot of really big capital costs, and they get themselves into kind of risky situations. So you know my idea was I, I want to um, one take no risk up front because I didn't really have much money, um, and I wanted to tell people that all the money that they were giving was going to go directly into our very first school. And so uh, I'm born on Halloween, which makes for a really really good time. Um, <laughs> And uh, I had always used it as a charitable fundraising party for different organizations that I was passionate about. And so um, for my 25th birthday, I said to, you know, friends and friend of friends, uh, come out to this one venue in New York City, um, pay $20 at the door or, you know, whatever you want, just provide a birthday present, but in lieu of an actual present, make it a donation to, to this organization, Pencils of Promise, and help me build one school that I'd like to dedicate to my grandmother. And uh, fortunately, about 400 people came out. We had about $8,000. And then I just, you know, reached out to anybody and everybody that I could. Uh, A lot of late night kind of relentless emails. Uh, And most people said no or they ignored me. But I think like most entrepreneurs, the more that people say no, the more you get inspired to prove them wrong. And so, um, you know, fortunately, I was able to find one organization that had worked in Laos where I wanted to get started. And they really helped me get a foot in the door. And uh, with with that kind of initial uh, introduction into some education ministry folks and a little bit of know-how of how to build our very first school uh, on the ground, then you know I just uh, threw on my backpack and moved out to Laos for a little while and, and really figured it out on the ground with essentially a lot of small donations. We did a masquerade event. We had people at my apartment for New Year's and we really bootstrapped it. Um, back then, you know, Kickstarter wasn't really up and going nor were many of the crowdfunding platforms. And so we, we initially raised capital through low-dollar events targeting young people in New York City uh, and saying to them, rather than spending your money at a bar or kind of having a destructive night, why don't you celebrate with us and, and have some type of positive outcome and help us build our first school? That's awesome. What, what was it like for you to see that first school go up or, or, or first know that it was going to happen and then actually see it? Oh, man, it was really, really emotional, truthfully. I mean, that that, that first groundbreaking ceremony, it was just such an impossible dream at the start to think that this was actually going to happen. And I knew everybody was telling me it's, it's, you know, not going to, it's impossible. You you need big philanthropic donors. You can't invert the traditional philanthropic model and go small first. Um, but I just, I, I kind of thought the world was going in a direction where people were going to value the little guy. Um, and that with the rise of digital and social media, you could find ways to engage people and show them that something as small as $25 could really, you know, make a huge impact. And so I remember being in this village called Patong in rural Laos and watching grandmothers carrying uh, big, big wooden, um, like two by fours. I mean, they were bigger than that, but uh, big wooden planks and me kind of rushing over and saying like, no, 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 don't carry that. You know, these are like very old women. Mm-hmm. And they would shoo me away. And uh, other people in the village would say, no, they've been waiting years and years and years to watch this school go out. They're going to be a part of it. And it was really emotional, truthfully, for me. That first one was really, really powerful. That's really cool. So what is your business now? What What is the like, what is it that you do now? Like, how would you describe your business now? Sure. So at this point, um, Pencil of Promise does a lot of things. But one of the things that we realized was that we wanted to make it um, really accessible. We wanted to make it fun. And we wanted to make it um, easy for individuals to create a really large impact in the lives of others. And that if we did that, we could actually provide something of value. We'd actually have an asset that we could essentially almost like uh, charge for. And so I think a lot of charity, they view themselves as kind of, um, you know, asking, 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 and they're not able to provide value in return. And and what I wanted to do was uh, build an organization that treated what we did as something of real um, significance. And so what we realized pretty early on was it was only $25,000 for us to build a full school. Uh, If you think about building a school in the United States, it's at least a couple million dollars, if not many, many more. Mm -hmm. And so this $25,000 number seemed incredibly accessible for people young, old, you know, rich or, you know, medium income or or low income. It still seemed like it was attainable. And so we decided to build out an all-local staff in the field 
that could ensure that people's money would be used effectively. Uh, 100% of donations that come in through our website go directly into our programs to help build schools. And then we are able to work directly with communities to help these schools uh, come to life. Uh, we work with education ministries as well. And then once they uh, are, are completed, not only does an individual have the opportunity to dedicate that school, much like the first school was dedicated to uh, my grandmother, second school dedicated to grandfathers, et cetera. Um, but we actually take people in the, into the field if they fund a full school. And that's a place where, again, we can provide tremendous value to an individual or a family or a business. Because if you think about a lot of businesses, um, it's tough to engage your employees and get them inspired. Mm-hmm. And it's also oftentimes really tough to get your consumers to switch brands to you versus somebody else. Uh, and when you look at the studies, uh, consumers are worth more than uh, 80% frequency likely to switch brands if all things are equal, if one brand or company or individual service provides some type of social benefit to society at large. And so what we're able to do is bring that value to companies so that they can say to their consumers, every time you purchase our product or every time you participate in this campaign, you're educating a child. And then the kind of completion of that is when the individuals from that company actually go into one of the countries where we build schools, which are Guatemala and Ghana and Laos. And we've worked in Nicaragua as well and have a life-changing experience out there uh, as well. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Now, is this a for-profit business or a non-profit business? So uh, I'll give you two answers. The first answer is we are a non-profit business. Um, we are not a, a for-profit. We're a registered 501c3. But um, one of the things that I've shared with a lot of people, unfortunately, it's, it's gained, gained pretty wide traction at this point, uh-huh. is the idea that the term non-profit actually does a huge disservice to the industry because it's the only term that starts with the word non to describe somebody's business. Right, like you would never describe. Um, I was telling somebody this morning, you would never describe uh, somebody that worked at Delta uh, as uh, someone that works in the non-automobile industry. You'd say it's the aviation industry, right. and yet that's what we do to the philanthropic sector. We describe it by what we aren't pursuing, uh, instead of describing what we are able to do. And so I, I call what we do for purpose work because that's what I think we're about. We're about maximizing. Uh, purpose, uh, social benefit. Uh, but from a tax status, yes, we're a 501c3 registered nonprofit organization. I see. So, you know, and, and the reason why I wanted to bring you here on the, on the show, Adam, was to have people think about more than just, you know, their business and, and, and entrepreneurship, but think bigger, you know, transform the world. I mean, that's even mentioned on, on your page here. Uh, I'm at adambraun.com slash book. It says, for anyone looking to transform the world, this book will show you how to get it done. So let, I mean, that, that's a quote from Richard Branson um, about your book, which is awesome that you have a quote from Richard Branson about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, but tell, let, let's get into the book. Tell us how myself, how all the listeners out there, how we can transform the world and how your book kind of helps us do that. Yeah, sure. So one of the things that um, I realized in, very early on is that as much as Pencils of Promise exists within the construct of a nonprofit or a, you know, a for-purpose organization, um, the, the principles in building a business around the things that you love, the pieces uh, that make you most come alive, are still consistent with any for-profit business. And so when I set out to write the book, um, the first thing that I, I decided was I'm not going to write this as some like charity kind of pity me story or pity the people that we work with. I wanted to write something that was incredibly empowering for any aspiring entrepreneur or someone who just feels stuck. Because that's how I felt. I mean, I, I was 24 turning 25. I had a, a job at what's now been rated uh, this year. Bain was rated the number one company to work for in the world. Twitter was number two. And so from, from all uh, perspectives, I had the dream job and, you know, the dream life. I was like living in this great apartment in Union Square in New York City, young guy, like single at the time. And somebody from the outside would have said, oh, he's doing everything right. But the reality is I felt very empty on the inside because I wasn't tapping into what made me most come alive and what fulfilled me with a sense of purpose. And so the way that I was able to manifest it was through the creation of this nonprofit. But I genuinely believe every single person has the ability to create something. Either it's a movement, an, an organization, or a company out of the thing that makes them most come alive. And it doesn't have to be a nonprofit. But what, what it ultimately has to do is it has to provide you individually with immense, immense fulfillment and, the, and meaning. Uh, and, and there's a big difference between happiness and meaning. And I think it's something that people 
uh, oftentimes bucket together. They say, oh, no, I want to have meaning in my life. I want to be happy. But, but they forget that, that happiness actually often ensues from meaning, not the opposite. Um, and that people that live very happy lives can often live very meaningless lives. And people that live with tremendous meaning can not always experience happiness. It can be really hard um, to live a meaningful life. But uh, w- what I found in, in writing this book is uh, that when I look back over the last five years, and, and just to kind of fast forward from that very first school that uh, I set out to build with $25, now we've broken ground on over 200 schools um, across the world. And, and we're breaking ground on a new school every 90 hours. Mm-hmm. And so the, the organization has scaled tremendously. But what I realized was I had all these lessons <laughs> that I had learned um, on the entrepreneurial path and I think it's applicable to your audience because I started off with this as a, almost like a, you know, when you think about passive income, it's, you know, this kind of stuff that works in the background, stuff that often sometimes starts off as a side job. This was my side passive, not income, but kind of passive purpose driver for me or, mm-hmm. or, or sense of um, how can I uh, just work on any business? And it happened to be a nonprofit. But, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, the book is written in 30 short chapters and every one of them is titled with a lesson learned. Um, and, and those 30 lessons learned are the things that I wish I knew when I got started. Awesome. Let, let's, let's get, dig into some of those lessons if you don't mind sharing, you know, oh, for sure. I mean, obviously you had a great idea. A lot of people have great ideas. What, how, how has your side project become what it is today? Yeah, so I, I think the, the first step that I was trying to share with people um, is that you have to begin um, with uh, getting outside of your comfort zone. You know, a lot of people, they try and stay within their lane. They say, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good at this. Um, and I find that, that the most successful individuals often don't stick to what they're good at. They stick to uh, the pieces that they feel like they internally have a calling to go pursue. And you often find that outside of your comfort zone. You know, it's, it's when you separate from a relationship or uh, it's when you leave a job or you go to travel to a foreign place. And, and my motivation behind that was music. Um, like all the great musicians that I loved, and even I'm not a big art person, but, you, you know, if you study art at all, you see that the great artistic works were never created when people were content or satisfied. It was always created in periods of struggle. You know, like their their country is torn with war or they just got their heart ripped out. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I I find the first thing is is people need to get outside of their comfort zone. And then the second is um, you do the small things that make other people feel big. And and it's not about, you know, truthfully, I, I just opened up a package before I hopped on with you. And it was from a guy who's got a new company hasn't gained a lot of traction yet, but he sent me such a thoughtful gift. And it wasn't the most expensive gift that I've received in my life. It wasn't, you know, the most ornate, but it was really thoughtful to me personally. And, and when I started, um, the first thing that I did, and you know, I didn't have a lot of money uh, in, in our kind of coffers at the time, but uh, I went on Vistaprint and I ordered uh, about 40 sets of $2.50 business cards. So I ordered $100 worth of business cards and I shipped them without individuals knowing to every single serious volunteer that we had. And I gave them a title and they had a Pencils of Promise business card. And all these people had full-time jobs. You know, they're, they're young professionals in New York. But suddenly they had a business card that had their name on it and it gave them a sense of ownership. And next thing I knew, I would talk to them and they'd be like, look, I'm going out at night and I'm giving out my pa- Pencils of Promise business card more than my Goldman Sachs one. <laughs> I love that. It sort of reminds me how, you know, I know a lot of people who have membership sites and forums and a lot of times yeah. they'll, sort of upgrade certain people in those forums, the people that are most active, Mm -hmm. to be admins or moderators. And those people are just on top of the world when you give them that, you know, uh, that, that sort of title. Um, and it's a small gesture, but you know, at that time, those people feel like, okay, now I have even more responsibility or now I'm actually, you know, in charge of this community. I'm going to do even more to make sure it's a place where people want to be. Um, so I, I love that. And that's, that's kind of what I, sort of the, the, the angle I'm feeling from, from that second tip there, um, for for the first tip, you know, beginning outside of the comfort zone. I mean, I can't express that enough. I mean, that's, that's why I'm now getting paid to do keynote presentations. I was deathly afraid of doing public speaking before, but I, but I knew it was something I had to do. Um, so I was going to ask you, I mean, you just mentioned yourself that you had, you you felt the same thing with, with public speaking with, um, what, what were some of the other things that were sort of outside of your comfort zone in the beginning when you got started that, that you just knew you had to do and, and just said, you know what, I'm just going to do it even though, even though, even though I'm scared. Sure. So there's, um, there's actually a chapter that's, that's titled, uh, vulnerability is vital. 
Um, and, and ironically, the whole thing actually got released uh, on entrepreneur.com today. So if anyone is listening, oh, they can just go on entrepreneur and, and almost preview the book and just read one of the full chapters. But that whole chapter is about um, me acknowledging my biggest single weakness, uh, which was asking for money. And you would think that that's the, the strength of somebody who's starting an organization that you know, now raises millions of dollars every single year. Uh, but it was the thing that I hated and feared most. Uh, I was so, so uncomfortable with asking anybody to give a dollar to the organization. And you know, in one of our board meetings, uh, my board of directors are, are incredibly accomplished, you know, well-known, highly respected business um, leaders. And so you know, I was kind of the young entrepreneur, and, and I had to put on this, this um, front of confidence and kind of perfection. Like I can't show them that I have flaws uh, in every board meeting. And finally, it got to the point where I realized if I didn't uh, open up to these people and say, hey, you know something, I'm actually really bad in this one area, and it's one of my biggest areas of growth, but it's one of the most important things for the success of the organization, and I suck at it. We were never going to progress. And so I, I, I did that in one of our board meetings, and I said, I need your help. I need you know, people to, to guide me. And they ended up um, linking me up with uh, one of the country's leading fundraising gurus, and I kind of studied in, in a course that um, she provided over, the, the, um, over a long weekend up at Harvard. And um, she called out to me what my biggest issue was, which is that I was putting myself at the center of the ask. And that I was essentially feeling like if I ask someone for money, I'm asking for money for myself. And she said, Adam, you, you, you have it all wrong. When you're making that ask, you're actually making that ask on behalf of the child in the village that you met when you were in Ghana last month. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's for the mother who's never been able to send her daughter onto secondary school. And if this person says yes to your ask, then her daughter goes to school. This has nothing to do with you and everything to do with them. Right. You'd, be, you'd as, be letting them down if you didn't do it. Right, right. And as soon as I started to make that mental and emotional and almost spiritual shift to say, this isn't about me, this is about them, that's who I'm asking for, um, it, it, it transitioned from a, a fear and a burden to actually an honor uh, to be able to, to kind of be the steward, you know, the conduit through which uh, these people were able to achieve education simply by me uh, being the one in New York or D.C. or San Francisco or L.A. or wherever else asking on their behalf. Mm. And so that, that was a third one for, for me that was just really transformative. I tried to share with a lot of people is that, you know, whatever your areas of greatest vulnerability are, those are the ones that often yield the biggest reward. And, you know, if you even think about your email, your inbox right now, my guess is there's about 80% of the stuff in there you could do pretty easily and pretty quickly. And 20% is really hard, requires a lot of thought, and it's going to scare you a bit because it's, you know, maybe something that you could fail at. And what we do is we spend most of our time tackling the 80%. You know, you spend a whole day moving through stuff because you feel like you're actually accomplishing something. But um, great leaders, they start off every single day and they say, what is that 20% that's going to move the needle for me? And that's what I need to focus on. And they don't leave the office or they don't leave the, you know, their, their inbox until they get that done. And, and it's acknowledging that vulnerability that enables it to become a, a strength. Yeah. I mean, I know, mo I mean, most people will do what's most comfortable for them and, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, that, that's really what it's all about. And, and a lot of people make excuses to, to, to mm -hmm. make that okay. Like, okay, I'm going to answer these 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 this eighty percent of these emails because you know it's quick and I just want to get them out of the way so I can focus on that twenty percent. Yeah. When yeah. really you're just making excuses. Completely. Now, how did your business grow so quickly? How did it how did it become so well known? Was it just the fact that you were building schools? I mean, I know a lot of people, especially in the space I'm in, they'll say, "Oh, well, a certain percentage of 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 your payment for my product will go to." charity a or charity b mm. and they think that that is enough you know to pull in a crowd or to get more traffic or to get more customers but is it no no i don't think it is actually i think a part of it is um you know like anything else i mean i think you've done a great job of this right which is kind of anticipating where an industry is going and to the to the like old wayne gretzky quote about not um going where the puck is but where the puck is going I love wayne you gretzky, at some though. point yeah yeah <laughs> At some point, you have to make a calculated bet and say, this is where I think things are going to be, and I'm going to position myself ahead of the curve. And if I'm wrong, I'm standing out alone in the desert by myself. And if I'm right, 
then everybody else is going to be in that same place in you know, 6 or 12 or 18 months, and i got to iterate all over again, but at least I'll be seen as a, a leader. And so you know, my first kind of big pet was on the rise of digital and social media, which now seems obvious, but in 2008, if you spoke to somebody in the charitable sector, they would say, why are you wasting time there? They're not going to get any big donors from that. You know, uh, charity moves through big philanthropic contributions, and you're not going to do that through little you know, y- young people clicking on like buttons and poking each other. Mm-hmm. And so um, I was Mark Zuckerberg's year in college, and so you know, we were basically beta testers for Facebook. And so you could just see that, that it was going to democratize social giving. And so that's one big place that I really invested in was actually not asking people for money, but asking them to join this community uh, that we created around Pencil of Promise and building one of the largest social media followings in the um, philanthropic space. And then the second one um, that really helped us scale hey, Adam, was... Is, is there what, something brushing up against the mic? Um, oh, I think my shirt. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh, no, no worries. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> cool. Uh, so uh, the, the second one that I, I think really enabled us to grow very, very quickly um, was, again, to this kind of idea of being a for-purpose rather than a nonprofit. We decided to start earning money rather than asking for it. And that meant using the size of our digital and social following or you know, the, the desire for certain people to bring philanthropy into their family in a way that uh, taught their kids you know, real philanthropic values. Um, and so we started to build cause marketing campaigns. And those could be with uh, foundations, those could be with individuals and uh, companies as well. And that led to, um, you know, I would say, partnerships with everybody from Google and Delta and Office Depot to the hottest startups like Warby Parker and Birchbox. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. And so through, through those partnerships, we were able to really grow from uh, at, you know the place of small contributions to then big contributions. And now, um, fortunately, uh, that's continued to scale. We raise uh, millions a year. Yeah, that's awesome. Man, first of all, just congratulations on all the success. I mean, and you're... you're it's changing lives. I think that's that's what's most important. That's what that's really what I what I want to end on is, um, you know, what is the mindset we need to have in order to affect the most people in the world? Yeah, I mean that's a great question. So there's a guy who's who's been a real mentor of mine that changed my thinking drastically when he posed a, a very simple but really profound question to me because I would always ask him. His name's Ray Chambers. Um, he was p- pretty much created Leverage Buyout in the the eighties. Um, you know, responsible for modern private equity, made gobs and gobs of money, but retired to to focus on literally transforming the world and. Uh, will will be responsible for eradication of malaria. He's now the UN Special Envoy for Global Health. Wow. And so um, he's just a legend. It's like, like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, George Soros, Ray Chambers. Like that's the, the kind of, um, I would say, uh, caliber of people that he's in. And so anyway, uh, he joined our board about two years ago. He's become a real personal mentor. And so I asked him, you know, this this same question. And what he said to me, I would share with your audience, which is think about where the world will go in the next 10 years and where your life can go during that same period and the difference in capabilities and resources and networks that you will have access to, and then craft a path to play the most meaningful role that you can in creating the world that you want to see. And as soon as he said that to me, it it changed my thinking. I stopped kind of thinking about how do I do something now? And you first have to understand and essentially kind of make that bet. Like how, where do you think the world's going to go in the next 10 years? And then within your own you know, networks, resources, capabilities, how can you play the most meaningful role? Not how can you solve this one thing yourself, but how can you play the most meaningful role in building the world that you want? And if you follow that as a guiding compass, uh, inevitably, I think anybody out there would, would truly transform the world with that. I love that. Perfect way to end the show. Thank you, Adam, so much for coming on. Um, actually, b- before we end, uh, tell us where we should go to check out your organization and also uh, you know, check out your book too. Sure. So the organization is called Pencils of Promise. You can go to pencilsofpromise.org uh, and then any of the kind of social channels you can find us on. Uh, then personally, you can go to adambraun.com. You can add a slash book at the end to uh, to check out details on the book and reviews and all that good stuff. And then uh, the book is called The Promise of a Pencil, How an Ordinary Person Can Create Extraordinary Change, and it's available on Amazon. Thank you. Any actually, other book retailer. Actually, <laughs> I, I'm actually on PencilsOfPromise.org right now. And actually, before I let you go, if you have a couple more minutes, um, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at your social numbers here. And right here on the yeah. front, it says, you know, um, tweets 6,938, Google Plus One, 
226 hundred thousand are you finding like google plus is working better for you or like what what are the sort of main social channels you're using to help spread your messages i guess what i'm asking so yeah sure so we focus on um i would say twitter instagram facebook and google plus we we tried pinterest a bit um we didn't see huge traction for our specific industry although if i was in retail for, for sure i'd be using pinterest pretty aggressively we've we've tested out tumblr a decent amount um it, it skews younger uh and there's really good engagement um doesn't always convert into whatever kind of activity you want them to take but definitely for engagement it's high um i, I would say on a personal front i use twitter most actively i have um about uh, just over 300,000 followers on Twitter. So that's where I, I tend to speak to my audience most. Mm-hmm. Uh, I use Instagram just for storytelling to kind of try and bring people into my eyes because um, I'm traveling and you know usually people want to know and kind of see what it's like to be in some of these places. And then um, I would say uh, I, I, I've started to use Google Plus more aggressively. Um, it, it's a different crowd, uh, but you end up finding some real gems there. And then I love uh, LinkedIn. Um, I used to never use it, but uh, lately I think the LinkedIn Influencer Program has break, brought great content to the platform. Uh, and then finally, Medium, um, I, I just think is a great uh, resource for any aspiring writer. Uh, I put a lot of my early writings up on Medium, and I wrote one blog post called uh, The Most Important Lesson That I Learned in My 20s. And I put it up uh, on my 30th birthday, and it became one of the most read Medium posts uh, out and just – truthfully led to so many opportunities from people reading that one post and then reaching out to me. Uh, and That's then I cool. use WordPress for my, my personal website, which, which I love. Can, can anyone write on Medium? Yeah. So originally it was um, a, a smaller book, uh, a group of uh, curated writers and a friend of mine was the, the original head of content. So she reached out and fortunately put me on the platform. But now I'm pretty sure they open it up to anybody. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful platform aesthetically. Um, and there's kind of this unwritten rule that like you don't put crap up there, you post quality content. And, and I think that that's carried through. Yeah. I, I mean, everything I've read on Medium has been fantastic. I've read articles from you know good friends with Smart Passive Income like Srini Rao and Chase Reeves and, and mm-hmm. um, just there's a lot of good stuff there. So thank you for mentioning that. I think that's some uh, really interesting things people can check out. And again, make sure to check out Adam and his book. We'll have all the show notes uh, for you up on the blog. Again, Adam, thank you so much for your time today and best of luck uh, to you and, and, and your organization and, and the launch of your book. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. All right, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Adam Braun from PencilsOfPromise.org, an author of his brand new book, The Promise of a Pencil, which is available now on Amazon and anywhere books are being sold. Uh, you can head on over to smartpassiveincome.com slash session 102 to get the show notes and link to that book and all that good stuff, everything we mentioned in this episode. I'm just looking at the website right now, pencilsofpromise.org. I mean, it says our impact, 200 plus schools, 20,000 plus students impacted and 15 million plus instructional hours completed. I mean, that's that's huge. And like I was talking about at the beginning of this episode, I need to think bigger. I really do need to think bigger about the impact that I want to have on this world. I mean, I know I have an impact on people's lives. I'm getting emails and handwritten thank you letters and things like that, which is amazing, but I, I want to do more. And so you're going to hear me for the first time tell you that I will do more. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it will. Um, like I said, I do donate some of my money, but I need I need to think bigger. I need to do something bigger. I have a lot of, you know, clout and authority in this space, and I think I could use it for so much more. So um, I'm just going to dwell on that for a little bit. But I want to. I want you know. I'm just being honest, and I want to share that with you here today. So again, Adam, thank you so much for the inspiration. I hope other people are thinking the same way too, thinking much bigger than themselves, trying to make an impact on this world. Thank you so much for that. And um, yeah, so again, the show notes can be found at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 102. And of course, I want to mention our wonderful sponsors of this particular episode, which is audiobooks.com, an amazing service you can use to listen to books on the fly. If you go on to audiobooks.com slash SPI, you'll get not only a 30-day free trial, not only a credit to download any book that you want that you can listen to, but you can also download the audio version of my book let go which is exclusively available right now on audiobooks.com through that promo at audiobooks.com slash s p i um a lot of people have been checking out the book and, and and getting those free credits awesome to hear that people are loving it and again thank you to those at audiobooks.com for the wonderful sponsorship here of this episode and thank you to the listener 
for spending time with me today. I really, really appreciate it. I hope you're thinking much bigger than you are right now because there's a lot of people out there who aren't as fortunate as us who deserve a better life and we have the ability to give it to them. So thank you so much. I will see you in the next episode of the Smart Passive Income Podcast, session 103, which uh, you'll hear a really, really good friend of mine who is back for the third time. Who is it? You'll have to say and see. Take care. I'll see you in the next episode. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Hey there, and thanks for sticking around to the end. If you're looking for more great shows like this one, definitely give How Success Happens a listen. Another great show from the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. On How Success Happens, Robert Tuckman features some of today's brightest entrepreneurial minds talking about overcoming challenges and viewing them as learning experiences to create success. The challenges that entrepreneurs face are ultimately what make many of us successful, however we define success, and that's what the show is all about. There's lots of names you'll surely recognize on the show every single week. Just recently, Robert had Nasty Gal CEO Sophia Amoruso on the show and the former CEO of Snapple the week before that, which is really awesome. So listen to How Success Happens right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.